Good morning and welcome to the Computer Channel. Today's dossier program is an introductory look at computer-aided systems engineering, or CASE. As we all know, technology is still divorced from the business objectives it seeks to serve. What's needed is an integrated set of computer tools that help users identify and deliver the right systems. These systems must also be delivered on time and provide the sort of accurate management information you need to make more informed decisions. But of course, that's a simplified view. For those in the know, CASE stands for Computer Aided Salary Enhancement. There's a shortage of skilled programming staff with CASE experience. There's also a lack of recognised standards. And the quality of software being developed using some tools leaves a lot to be desired. The case development cycle is also relatively slow, one which needs speeding up. Well, Richard Barker's used to delving into the whys and wherefores of case. He's well known for his series of books on the subject, and he's arguably one of the best around to present an overview of what case is and what it can do. In a sense, David Fairburn needs no introduction. In the early 70s, David worked at ICL as Managing Director of ICL Dataset, but was perhaps best known as Director of the National Computing Centre between 1985 but, sorry, between 1980 and 1985. He's now Group Managing Director of Case Specialist James Martin Associates. This morning, he looks at case productivity. My final guest is Alan Topless from Price Waterhouse, who will be talking about who really benefits from using case. Alan spent a great amount of time helping PW clients select and develop case tools. He was uniquely placed to see who gains from using the technology and who loses. Well, remember, Kate Dossier is a programme where you can phone in and talk to our experts with me here in the studio. The number to ring is 081 681 5280. 081 681 5280. The phone lines are now open and we'll try and answer your calls in the three or four minutes we have between presentations. But first, Richard Barker. Richard is a main board director for Oracle and senior vice president of Oracle Europe. This morning he's opening the proceedings with a personal introduction to Case. Richard. Computer-Aided Systems Engineering, CASE, is a new software technology that is revolutionising the way companies build computer systems. In the next few years, it will become a critical component in every company's system development toolset, in the same way that relational database and fourth-generation languages are today. Before I describe CASE, technology, I want to answer the question, why is CASE needed at all? In the past 20 years, the use of computer systems in business has grown enormously. They are now a vital aspect of every company's life, helping organisations control their operations and helping executives to make better decisions. Companies often spend over 10% of their total corporate budget on hardware, software and networking capability. Yet, throughout the history of the use of computers, their true usefulness has been significantly hampered by two problems. First, the quality of the systems is often very poor in terms of suitability, and reliability. It is a fact that most computer-based systems do not meet the needs of the user nor the overall goals of the company. The clearest evidence to support this view is the huge maintenance overheads most data processing organizations incur. In the Western world some 70 percent of all data processing resource is used performing maintenance tasks on existing systems. Any application system is effectively a model or simulation of part of the business and until very recently there were no really good modeling techniques to enable us to create systems which closely match those business needs. The second problem that has beset the industry is that of development productivity. In general the industry can only deliver systems four or perhaps five times faster than it did in the early 1970s and yet all other aspects of computers have improved by several orders of magnitude in the same time span. Over the years, many software technologies have been developed that go some way to addressing this problem. For example, the use of relational database and fourth generation products has helped many companies get systems faster. CASE is therefore aimed at producing high quality, appropriate systems on time. So let's go back to the beginning. Where does the word CASE come from? Well, it actually comes from the engineering industry. It is the ability to apply the assistance of computers to the engineering process. It would be inconceivable to create an aeroplane of the sophistication shown here 
without it being engineered in a highly professional, structured manner, and without using advanced computer processing and rigorous diagrammatic conventions to get the design correct. The very first case tools provided support for the diagramming techniques needed to design good computer systems. These were standalone products, typically on a personal computer, providing intelligent graphics capability. These simple tools immediately gave benefit to the design process by the enforcement of the conventions and the clarity which comes from good diagrams. Uh, a diagram speaks a thousand words, as the saying goes. Nowadays, however, case tools are more sophisticated and tend to have a common architecture. This architecture brings together very many things. The first of them, and arguably the most important, is the methodology, or method. A stage-by-stage -stage process to take the development of a computer system from conception through to final implementation. The second component is an analyst or designer workbench which enables the systems engineers to work on a very powerful workstation uh, to manipulate in real time the diagrams that they need for their trade. These might be data flow diagrams, entity relationship diagrams, state transition diagrams, and so on, as appropriate to the system they are building. The third component is the one which joins it all together. It is the concept of a dictionary or repository, which can be used to store all of the information required by the systems engineers whilst they go through this life cycle. Another way of putting it is that this is the multi-user database for use by development staff. The fourth component is that which makes the real difference to productivity and quality. It is the use of generation tools which can generate table and file definitions, interactive application programs, reports, menus and even the documentation. So let's have a look at these components in turn. Now there are a variety of methodologies around in the industry. Now these include information engineering, Maurice, Jordan, Niam and so on. All of them break down the life cycle into different stages, as shown on this diagram. They define tasks which have to be carried out, and deliverables which are used to ensure that the process moves smoothly from one stage to another. As Crosby, who is a, an expert on quality, would say, it's easy to measure the cost of poor quality. The cost of correcting problems after the event is considerably higher than building in the quality in the first instance. The numbers down the side of this diagram illustrate the cost of correcting errors when they are found later and later on during the life cycle process. So the adoption of a well-proven methodology is a prerequisite. You then need case software, which is designed to support your chosen method. It is useful to look at the dictionary or repository next, as this is the database into which all other case components store information. In simple terms, it is shown by this diagram. Now we have here two main concepts at the business level. On the left we have the information needs of the business and on the right we record information to do with the business process or functions which are carried out. These would typically be modelled using special diagrams and we will see some of those in a moment. Facilities in the tool enable us to cross-relate to information uh, to ensure that nothing has been missed. Utilities would be provided to undertake the task of transforming the business level information needs into computer concepts such as tables and files and records. And on a similar basis the functional requirements are also transformed and in this case they become program module definitions, specifications which are ready to be used subsequently by the generator products. Sometimes you'll hear the terms uppercase and lowercase. These refer to case tools which predominantly address either the top or the bottom of this diagram. Now, if we look at the Analyst Designer Workbench, then we use many different diagrammer types. Here, for example, we see a screenshot from an IBM OS2 workstation running under Presentation Manager, where the software engineer is using a data flow diagram. This is an excellent tool to define the flow of information through a complex process. Here, on the other hand, we see a different type of diagram which is capturing the information needs of the business, on what is called an Entity Relationship Diagram. You'll notice it is recording information about people, assignments, departments and the relationships between them. In this particular case we are using a high resolution workstation from Digital running under the DEC Windows system to provide a very high usability desktop environment. 
To ensure completeness, most of these tools also supply some form of matrix diagram, as shown here, where we can relate, uh, cross-relate two different concepts. In this particular case, we have the information needs of the business, such as the details about clients, companies, employees, and products. And we can see where this information is used geographically across this international company. This will enable us to determine the distributed requirements of any future system. And like any engineer, each analyst or designer will typically want to work on several concepts at the same time. Now high resolution desktops are becoming commonplace today and are cheap enough to use for this purpose. Typical examples include uh, workstations from Sun, Hewlett Packard, Digital, Data General and suppliers of X Windows terminals. Now the final part is the application of the, uh, the generation component. This would be thought of very simply by looking at this schematic which shows on the top the various diagrams that we have been discussing. Information needs are on the left again, function needs are on the right, and data flow diagrams in between. Now the arrows going down the page denote this transformation process to table and file design on the left and uh, program design on the right. What the generators then do is apply standard rules for layout, integrity and processing logic and an understanding of the target computer language which they are generating. Now the early generators only produced languages like COBOL whereas nowadays the generators are producing code in fourth generation languages, in sophisticated report writers and the C programming language such that the resultant code is highly portable across many operational target environments. For example, we could generate industry standard SQL, which could be driven against an Oracle, DB2 or Ingress database. Or we could generate the sophisticated interactive screens needed for a customer order system. This type of generator can automatically look after referential integrity, screen layout, usability and provide processing logic for such things as updating totals and enforcing business rules. This generation process thereby builds in quality and can often give a 10 or even 20 to 1 productivity improvement. So, these are the basic components of CASE. To be very useful in a development environment where a company uses hardware from several suppliers, modern CASE tools are designed against a clear, layered ar internal architecture. In the centre of this diagram, we can see a CASE tool from some vendor or other. Now, to enable that case tool to work against a workstation from any hardware vendor, perhaps using one of the many different types of industry standard window managers, the internal architecture will provide a graphics service which dynamically configures the case tool to this target workstation environment. On a similar basis, we are seeing the emergence of a lower layer of dictionary or repository service which enables the case tool to transparently use a dictionary or repository from different suppliers. Now, candidate repositories include the IBM repository, Digital's CDD+, Oracle's Port Portable Dictionary, the ICL Data Dictionary System, and several others. Given this sort of architecture, it is then possible to configure development environments like this, where a shared dictionary or repository is put on the super mini or mainframe of your choice. Then networking software enables ordinary terminals, personal computers and workstations from perhaps many different vendors to update the repository in real time. A good example of this is at General Dynamics. They have over 200 development staff working on a wide range of projects using over four or five different types of workstation across the same shared network to the same multi-user dictionary. Case tools today, therefore, not only enforce the rigorous graphical techniques that engineers have always recognized as essential, they supply utilities to transform the business level requirement into working code. And they do this in a shared environment which encourages systems engineers to work together in a team. The next generation of case tools is analogous to the just-in-time processing concept in engineering. It is going to add to the existing product set the concept of integrated project management which will enable the key financial, physical and human resources to be controlled effectively to fully maximise the use of these already powerful tools. Thank you very much Richard. Well just to summarise Richard's main points again.
case is the ability to apply the assistance of computers to the engineering process. The basic components of case, of course, are the methodology, the analyst or designer workbench, the dictionary or repository, and, of course, the generation tools. David Fairburn, if I can come to you first. I mean, obviously, we've case first hit the, hit the news in the late 70s, became very popular in the mid-80s. One would have thought most companies now would be using case in some way. What, the, what has the take-up been? I think there's been a very high take-up of the use of uh, individual tools. Uh, if you look at most development shops now, certainly I think the numbers are running into, into the 80s, 80% 80 or more, will have uh, uh, one or other of the development tools. Many fewer will have gone to the lengths of having a fully integrated case tool. We have seen the very large companies and uh, those for whom system development is critical have made that investment, but that is changing extremely fast. We're in the midst now of a revolution and by 1995 it will be rare to find any substantial company not making use of a major case tool. That is the confident prediction of the industry. Alan Topless, what about your PW clients? I mean, obviously it's quite a booming industry for the consultancies in terms of s software at the moment. Um, have you find a lot of new take-up, or are the existing customers tweaking existing applications? I think there's a lot of new take-up, I think, as people are finding their need to develop new systems very quickly to gain that extra competitive edge, and they're having to resort to case tools in order to do that. So I think it's very important, and they are certainly taking it up in, ab in abundance. I think the big problem is that they, there's an awful lot of hype, and they need to cut through that hype in order to get down to what really is going to be give, giving them their productivity gains in the, in the next, next generation, really. So, uh, Richard, it's interesting to see those, that early diagram you had where you had the, the, the development process on the right, you had a very thin sliver of strategy on the case and not on the other. <laughs> Is that, does that mean with, with conventional development you don't have a strategy? Well, I think there's, um, <clears throat> there's a major dilemma which is uh, across, the, across the world, which is that in, in Europe, I think there's a, a, a perceived need to have strategy that gives you a framework to do the de development within. Uh, in the States in particular, they're, they're really into hack it and go, and um, that's caused them some real dilemmas, even using very sophisticated tools today. Uh, what we're hoping, I guess, is that um, the case is, is sneaking in on them from underneath and they'll have to do strategy later on just to be able to control it properly. So, it's, uh, conventional, it's conventional systems development so it's still the sort of thing you scribble on the back of a fag packet. Well, over there it is, yes, I'm afraid. Uh, or more, more these days, uh, I think it's get on a workstation and play around with the graphics and see what comes out. So how do you choose, oh, you said earlier, the methodology mm -hmm. is, is arguably the most important part of the whole process. Right. How do you go about choosing the right methodology? Well, there, there are really only um, uh, two or three major methodologies around. Uh, I think you know we're very strongly in favour of the information engineering methodology, and there are others like SSADM and um, and the other ones I mentioned. Um, the one, the way I would choose it is, is really go to somebody who's used it and say, does this fit into the way you run your business? What effect did it have on the on the staff and the uh, the way they ran their business? Because you're asking people to change the way they work. And that is fundamentally quite a more important problem than introducing a new software tool. Uh, so once you've got that established, the software side of it itself is, is relatively straightforward. David? Yes, I, I couldn't agree more strongly. I think the, the methodology is what it's all about. The tool is enabling that. The tool is enabling us to tackle some very complex problems which have been specified by the methodology. What I hope is going to happen, I think we see signs of this, is a move towards some real standards in this field so that we can have an open approach to methodology and a convergence so that we do not have major contestants. That is already happening. If you look at the integrated case field, there is a predominance of an approach to methodology. And uh, indeed, we are doing some significant work in the standards field now to try and bring these things together to get a common definition of the tasks to be performed giving a degree of freedom about some of the techniques. I think that's what users are really looking for, a common methodology with some flexibility under it, which is exactly what a standard situation should provide and I believe over the next two or three years will provide. You've heard a lot about open systems though, isn't it? It's just one, one other piece of hype that we say, well, we'd like to have an open methodology, but really it's something we're, we'd like to work towards, but we, which will really will never happen, because it's not in anybody's interest to happen, really. Well, let me just... Systems are yes. so proprietary. Let me just tell you a very remarkable <coughs> demonstration I saw exactly three weeks ago today, where a system, it was a modest-sized one, developed under one uh, particular regime, uh, appearing on a particular terminal, was within the space of half an hour 
we developed and sent down to four different environments, including digital, an Oracle environment, uh, a uh, Fujitsu environment, a TI environment, the OS2 environment, and that happened within the space of half an hour. I mean, that sort of freedom, that capacity to develop your systems independently of the ultimate target software and hardware environment, and then confidently to be able to go down with great speed and to place them on those systems, that's what the user is really looking for, and that is now, I believe, within our grasp. Um, the methodology, the methodology you said earlier, should, I mean, people have to change the way they work to suit the methodology. Should it not be the other way around? Obviously, there are, there are slight tweaks you must you must make in terms of fitting proprietary systems in a more common environment. But surely the methodology really ought to match more the way you work, right, what you work, rather than the other way around. Yes, I think that that is being attacked at the moment. Um, there are some. Um, Case for case tools, which, where you can define your own case tool, which enables you to tailor them to the methodology of your choice, yes. which may be your own. The, you know, exactly. there may be yes. you know a, a proprietary system within a company, and a lot of the case tools are adding flexibility in to enable that to occur. Because at, at the end of the day, uh, although the vendor of the case tool may well recommend some minor changes to what you already do, if you can keep some of the things that we were familiar with before, then the adoption process goes much more smoothly. Fine. Okay. Well, I think we'll. Thank you, gentlemen. We'll move on there to my, to my next guest, who is, of course, David Fairbairn, Group Managing Director of Case Specialists, James Martin Associates. This morning, he looks at case productivity. David. Well, you know, case is really no longer just a, a white hope on the horizon. It really is here and now. If I look back some three years, one could make then some fairly good predictions, some of them tentative, some of them confident. Fascinating looking back now to realise that not all those predictions stand the test of time, including, indeed, some of the confident ones. I think, however, the one that really does is the main premise that case is crucially important to the world of complex systems development and is becoming more so. And above all, it works. I think, however, the first lesson that uh, we have to learn is to separate case into meaningful categories. We need to do that if we're going to make some worthwhile generalizations. The most important distinction is that between individual case tools performing singular separate functions. This is non-integrated case. On the other hand, there are those which integrate tool use from the high-level analysis down through the construction phases, doing all of this around a central repository or encyclopedia. And this is what we call I-case or integrated case. Both of these have their rightful places in the marketplace, but they do involve very different levels of investment and commitment, and have quite dramatically different potential for payoff. The benefits derived from deploying non-integrated tools for analysis, design, project management or construction are generally tangible but modest. And they do depend a great deal upon the skill and thoroughness of the user in working to a consistent set of rules or a methodology which itself may not be directly bound in with the tool. They represent a useful further step forward in bringing that uh, rather unruly process of system development under control. But they are rather less than the trumpeted breakthrough to a brave new world. However, the use of these tools has substantially enabled that steady improvement in productivity in the last decade. This has averaged, I suppose, about 8 or 10 percent annually, and is usually achieved in bursts of 30 or 40 percent. This tends to happen when you adopt a new tool, an improved methodology, a fourth generation language. It doesn't, however, solve the problem of a demand for complex systems creation 
which is escalating at well over twice that rate and has left us with a massive backlog today of undeveloped systems. Now, iCase, integrated case, is a rather different beast. It's a great deal more ambitious. It sets its sights on three to five hundred percent improvements in productivity, and that is what is needed to keep pace with that explosive demand. It is at the same time a very much greater investment. It's quite common to see investments well over a quarter of a million pounds in tools, and that in turn overshadowed by even higher training and consultancy costs. Predictably, I suppose, there are few contenders who have set out to achieve the full integration of that process which starts with high-level modelling and progresses in a unified environment to fully automatic system generation. And there are fewer still who have, at this point in time, succeeded. But the crucial fact is that they have, and that is of immense significance to all of us concerned with system development. Now, in achieving that, there are some lessons learned. Some are fairly obvious, some rather less so. Intriguingly, those lessons parallel the lessons learned the hard way in the field of physical automation. Now, the most cited benefit of automation is the contribution that it makes to productivity. That escalation in volume that can be produced in a given time or from a given resource. The more valuable benefit, however, is that of repeatable precision. That's the continuing contribution to quality. If the process can be effectively automated, then that characteristic of quality will normally be resident and strongly based. This in turn leads to a surprising axiom which is the opposite of some of the predictions made earlier and the kind of advice that may have been given three or four years ago. When deploying integrated case technology, it pays handsomely to go for the speed and the rapidity of production, confident that the quality will hold up. The fact is that the first six million lines of code generated by the information engineering facility from Texas Instruments emerged without one single coding fault. And the latest detailed analysis completed just a month ago of some 50 substantial systems generated by the information engineering facility in the United States repeats that pattern. Zero coding defects. Now the benefits of these techniques can of course be taken in alternative ways. We can take them in terms of speed and rapidity of production or we can taste the, take them in increased functionality and enlarging the scope of the systems that are produced within the same time. There's been a very strong tendency for system developers to take the benefit in broadened scope, even though they've often sacrificed much end-user goodwill in doing so. They go for enriching the system. And this has generally been counterproductive. It has caused log jams at the end of the analysis process. What we learn is that it really does pay to go for rapid development. It also pays to go for modest-sized modules, to take it in bite-sized chunks, and to build our more complex systems in this modular way. In fact, the key strength of integrated case is that it enables staged working without any loss of overall consistency. Because you see, the tool, or perhaps more importantly, the methodology embedded within that tool, takes care of that consistency. The productivity gains are real and measurable. And another lesson is that it is important to keep track of that factor, preferably by using function point analysis or alternatively by charting the number of transactions that have been completed. Using these measures, gains of between 3 and 500 percent 
have been realized at a relatively early stage and the later experience is edging the averages in the direction of a predicted thousand percent. We really are seeing a tenfold improvement in critical productivity. Now the investment in culture change, in training and reorientation, is more substantial and important than the mere mastery of the technical aspects. The long-term benefits are, are massive, but consistency over a period of years is required to realize them. We need here to establish a balance. It does reinforce the need to use the rapid application development te techniques to bring forward the achievement now of identifiable benefit. And that serves to maintain goodwill and momentum without losing the enormous benefit of that uh, long-term improvement in consistency and effectiveness of the system. So I think perhaps the most important single lesson of all is that the time to get to grips with this vital way of working is indeed now, if not indeed yesterday. Thank you, David. Just a few of David's main points again. Case tools fit into two families, another non-integrated case and I case. Non-integrated case benefits, of course, tangible but modest and depend upon the skill of the user. I case benefits are, of course, mixed. You get high productivity, but then again, you need a high level of investment in training and consultancy. Alan, if I can come to you, um, obviously in dealing with your customers, productivity must be pretty top on the list. How, how have you defined how to measure productivity when you're I think it's been quite difficult to actually measure productivity in real terms. You can obviously measure productivity at the programmers and the analysis stages and so on. When you come down to the real gains, the real benefits, you'll find that they come very much after the process of, of analysis and programming is completed, when the users get grip of the tools or get grip of the programs and then find, of course, that all the things that used to happen now don't happen anymore. They actually get programs that fit their business needs. And this is the area which, of course, we're finding quite difficult to measure the real benefits. But nevertheless, this is where our clients are finding the benefits really exist. They, they come really downstream. There are obviously significant benefits early on, but they really come downstream, and that's where the companies really do win, as I'll demonstrate later on, I think. It's difficult, though, isn't it, Richard? I mean, arguably, the more problems arrive later on in the cycle. Um, ironically, where it's not really a case problem at all, it's a traditional programming problem, actually generating code. What can be done to slightly smooth over the process, do you think, and try and make prepare you better for the later process? Well, that's a good point. I mean, well, I mean, part of it is actually to do with the technology you choose to implement these things in, because um, a lot of the problems that we have brought upon ourselves in the industry today is because we have so much technology that we can bring to bear, uh, and it's changing so rapidly that if you do produce programs, uh, how do you, how are you you're going to know that they're going to work on the computer you're going to choose in six months' time, or the new networking protocol, or the new window manager? And I think part of that key is uh, where these generators can come in. They can generate code which runs on uh, various devices, as we were alluding to a few moments ago, mm. uh, which can transport you from one to another very quickly. Or you can generate code which has this layered architecture which protects you from a lot of this technology problem. So that's part of it. Uh, the, other, the other area is, as the generators and in, in, indeed the richness of the repositories underneath them becomes more and more rich, then we get closer and closer to 100% of generation of the code. Uh, at the moment, most of the case vendors, including our own around this table, I'm sure, will say we all produce 100% generation of code. Well, that's true, uh, but in the wider spectrum, that's not still not quite the case, uh, and we have to add in those extra bits, and that's still where some of the risk comes in, in later down the process. David? Yes, I think that is, uh, is, is absolutely true. What we are seeing is a steady enrichment of the areas that can be addressed with this case technology and extension into the new environments. It is one of those ironies, true I think of other fields as well, that the price of freedom is discipline and that the application of an engineering discipline, which is what we're talking about here, is the thing that gives you that freedom to move. That marvellous freedom that an engineer has in building a bridge or a house where he can draw upon a common experience of what works and he can put modules together. That's what the software and system developer needs. That is what we are building in the case environment. And if it means imposing a discipline in order to secure that, that is the price that we must pay.
one always gets the problem. Is, is case a, a mere trade-off between speed and functionality? You can kind of spread yourself so thin over such a wide area. I mean, I mean obviously James Martin heavily involved in rapid, ad, rapid application development. Mm. How does it work? Do you, do you split up the area into smaller chunks and therefore be able to to hit the problem very quickly and then continue and then eventually cover yes. a wider area? These, these, these are alternative strategies about the way in which you can set out to develop a, a system. Uh, in the past, in the waterfall method, the traditional method of development, you really didn't have a choice. If you were going to integrate a system, you had to start with the full bandwidth of that system and come straight down through it. The fascinating thing about case is you don't need to do that. What you should do at the strategic level is to scope what you're trying to do, break it into a smaller component, and then develop that. Because now, of course, you have the capacity to go back and integrate, not at the coding level, but you're integrating right up at the analysis model level. And therefore, each of the components that you develop will be consistent and they will bolt together. Now, people need to realize that this means a new technique and a new approach to system development. It's for that reason that one advocates that it is much better to narrow the scope, go for a rapid result, but don't for one moment lose sight of the fact that the longer term benefit is that capacity to integrate across the totality. But how do you know what you're producing is, is very clean code at the end of the day? I mean, how do you measure, uh, how, how, do you, how do you know in terms of a quality measurement point of view, what you will eventually be producing will be a, a clean because code Because at product? any point at which it's not, the system shouts at you and it says stop. Here are warnings, here are errors, clean it. And what we have discovered, I mean, the point I was making earlier, of course, very large systems, it has been possible running that system to get those checks, and then when you hit the button and generate the code, that code runs first time 100%. We've never seen that in system development before, and that is really happening. And it's very nice to see the discipline, the logic of a discipline, actually emerging in practice and proving itself to be correct. Alan, the technology where we've reached a stage now where we, we're faced with similar problems we had 20 or 30 years ago, but we're playing around with new technology to, to, to try and rectify those problems. How, how is new technology helping the case environment at the moment in terms of the workstations you've, you've, we've seen so much about? There are, you can do a lot more things, can't you, on workstations? Oh, right? yes, I think that uh, these days that the users are able to sit around the workstations and effectively model their, uh, their requirements on, online. And this is tremendous benefit because very often a, a user in the old, in the old environment took away some output and came back and said, it's not quite what I want, can I change it and can I do this and that? And the process was quite a lengthy process. Now this process is interactive, sitting with the design team and the analysts, and online you can actually change things in front of you and come up with a better answer. And it really is very effective. Very, quite, very a quite a dangerous thing to do, to sit down with the design team and get both sides working. That's well, quite a gamble to the, take. The, I think you have to come to a point in time where, where you have to sort of draw a line somewhere, but uh, it, it is uh, very helpful. All right, Alan, we'll get on to that in a moment or two. Well, later on in today's programme, Alan Topless looks at who actually benefits from CASE. But first, a look at Navigator, a methodology aimed at firms with 30 or more systems development staff and with software development bills, of course, of over a million a year. Ernst Young has poured big money and five years' work into the technique, which offers a common architecture for all the stages of software development. Navigator's principal designer is partner John Parkinson. Navigator's our attempt to create a framework that will allow our clients' information system departments to become effective developers of information systems for their businesses. If you look at the history of the last 20 years, the IS industry has singularly failed to do that, and we believe it's because they've left a lot of important pieces out, which Navigator now includes. So what are those important pieces? Probably the most important is complete coverage of the development lifecycle from information strategy planning, where you look at what the enterprise's real requirements are, right the way through to learning to live with the applications that you've built in the past. And most of your current applications were built a long time in the past, of course. What sort of applications can you create with Navigator? Well, Navigator can be applied to create any kind of commercial data processing application. Typically, what we find our clients build are the ones that are of most importance to them now. They find out what's most important by doing the information strategy planning process, and then Navigator gives them the tools and approaches that lets them build those applications fast and accurately, and much faster than normal. We're not talking about maybe a two-year development process anymore. More typically, we're talking about eight to 16 months. Of course, the end part of that process, some would argue, isn't a case process at all. Well, it's got to be a case area. And um, the difficulty we have is, of course, that historically it has not been addressed by case tools. 
But because it's three quarters of what everybody really spends their resources on, unless you can get some leverage in that area, case doesn't buy you as much as the vendors would claim. And Navigator contains approaches and technologies that allow you to apply case effectively to your existing application. Do you think the cost of case puts people off? I'm sure it does. That's mostly because they don't understand their objectives in using case. It's too often seen as something, that, a toy that you give to the developers to keep them quiet. And it's not seen as an essential step towards more effective systems development processes. If you take a corporate view of that kind of investment and you look at it over the whole life cycle of the software you're building, then you discover that case is not that expensive in terms of what it can bring you. But to get all the benefits, you have to change a lot of things and people are naturally resistant to change. Can you measure the benefits though? I mean, can you measure in terms of cost, rather like measuring IT, I suppose? Well, we believe you can, but that you have to start sensibly. You have to start by saying what it is you want to measure, what is important to you to improve, and then you have to measure where you are today. At some stage in the future, you're going to be asked what's changed with case, and if you don't know what was going on when you started, you won't be able to give a very good answer, even if you've measured the change process. The way forward seems to be with the repository approach. Um, what way forward, what do new developments do you see for CASE over the next couple of years? I think we'll see two kinds of developments. Firstly, tools that are working against some kind of common repository via a model, which IBM calls the information model, for that repository. And that'll let them work together more effectively. It'll take a while, but there's a, a big push in that direction. Secondly, I think we'll see the tools containing a lot more helpful knowledge about the development process which developers can tap into. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll have to be less skilled, but they'll have to be less rigorously trained in order to use a development methodology and development support tools. John Parkinson explaining all about Navigator, Ernst & Young's software development methodology. Well, if you've just joined us, I have with me in the studio three case experts, Richard Barker, David Fairbairn and Alan Topless. If you'd like to ask them any questions, then the number to ring is 081 681 5280. I'll repeat that for you. 081 681 5280. Well, my final guest is Alan Topless from Pricewaterhouse. He is uniquely placed to see who gains from using case technology and who loses. Alan. In my experience, companies at all stages of maturity in the use of computer systems can gain from the use of case tools. Broadly, these companies fall into four categories. Firstly, companies who are embarking on information technology strategy studies to support their business objectives. These companies may be planning the future development of their computer systems for the first time or wishing to capitalise on what's already been built. Secondly, there are companies who are already well down the track of building systems and find they have new ones to add, they might wish to use prototyping tools to assist their users in visualising their detailed requirements. Thirdly, those who are embarking on the design of technical components of their systems. A good example here might be a company who has a portfolio of applications that meet their needs but don't make the best use of available database technology. And lastly, companies who are re-engineering their applications into new languages or more flexible environments. Quite typically, these organisations have a stable IT environment, but over the years their systems have become quite outdated, inflexible, undocumented or inefficient. And here, re-engineering can overcome some of these problems. The earlier in the development cycle that you involve case tools, the more benefits you get. And this chart shows where we find most of the errors occurring when developing new systems by the old traditional methods. The real cost of solving the problems created by poor analysis can be high and we're able to analyse them. The range of relative costs of fixing errors rises as systems move from initial analysis into design, programming and subsequent live running. Properly used, case tools prevent such errors from occurring and can easily assist us to pay for investment in them. So, how do you know whether you should be using case tools? Here's a checklist to help you make the initial decision whether case tools could benefit your company Providing you really do answer them honestly, you have a foundation for making the decision, case or not. 
Of course, this is only the start because you have to identify then the correct case tool to use. Can information systems help your, you achieve your business objectives? Do you require better value for money from your IT function? Is the ongoing cost of maintenance too high? Can your existing systems be quickly changed to meet the important business opportunities? Do your IT staff need time to be more innovative? Can staff morale and retention be improved? Do you wish to improve control over your IT projects? Having defined the types of organisation that can reap benefits from adopting case tools, let's now look at where and who gets those benefits within the organisations. And here are some real examples of how benefits arise. Firstly, from the IT manager's point of view. They benefit through their ability to deliver systems smoothly and effectively without suffering from those traumatic teething problems caused mainly by poor analysis. They find themselves much more in control of their own destiny. They now have planning tools and can measure real progress on their projects. And they tell me, we really know where we are now. The tools enable them to present a more professional image as engineers of software and to be capable of delivering the goods with the confidence that they are doing a good job which is appreciated by the end users and they do it to realistic timetables. The next winners are the IT staff who maintain and develop the systems. They gain because the methods and tools help them to work effectively within a clearly defined framework and there are lots of milestones to demonstrate to management and the users that the work is being done successfully. And Despite the uninformed criticism that case tools de-skill the process, there's a very definite role for creativity in their work, albeit within a discipline framework. I think, if anything, the challenging problems are more quickly revealed. Training, an essential prerequisite to using case, confirms the trends of professionalism in the IT software business and enhances the work prospects too. IT professionals can look forward to spending more time on the more interesting uses of information technology and less time on the drudgery of maintaining and trying to document systems which fail regularly. So much for the IT provider's perspective. What about the benefits in the wider business world? And this is where the gains from CASE have the greatest impact. End users of computer systems gain in many ways. They contribute more effectively during the development of the systems by seeing models and prototypes of the facilities while they are on the drawing board, or should I say on the computer terminal. And in many instances, users may now be able to change the prototype with a mouse or a touch-sensitive screen. Systems delivered to the end users fit their needs and possibly even individual styles of working much more closely. The delivered systems are more flexible and allow them to use and to be used in different ways as new methods of working evolve within the organisation. Data held within the systems can be accessed with user-friendly languages and then analysed more easily than in traditional constructed systems. It's very important that the new user requirements appear more quickly and be easy to change when needed because of all the potential data requirements have been identified up front. But you know, the real acid test as to who gets the gains achieved is the business. Today, the company can concentrate its management effort on the development of strategic, forward-looking or innovative systems, which gives some form of competitive advantage, because the case tools do vastly reduce the workload involved in building operational systems, which are inevitably the first priority. Case-constructed systems ensure that those critical lifeblood systems are well structured, allowing for so-called executive information tools to provide genuine information for management. They do this by allowing the pool of data held by the company's computers to be presented in ways which keep management up to date with performance, allowing them to review options and to take effective decisions. The companies will now have a well organised accessible and structured and secure store of information about all of its systems. A key component 
in the infrastructure that has been traditionally poorly organised. Well qualified system staff have always been in short supply and this store of information goes a long way to protect the company from losing key staff members. Their work, understanding and good ideas are safely stored in a form that can be accessed and used by others when required. And importantly, if the business entity is going to be reorganised, the opportunities for restructuring and the speed that it can be accomplished in will be dependent on their capability to provide systems to support the new business. Flexibility and quality of software is a critical success factor in the speed of providing such systems, whether brand new or existing systems reshaped. My experience has been that the company can protect its investment in the software built with case tools because when it comes to replace the hardware, it will still be able to make the most of its investment in developing that software. Finally, a word of warning. Typically, I'm finding that the real benefits to companies are the long-term gains. They are productive, there are productive gains, of course, to be had in the short term from the better utilisation of the IT professionals and the computer technology. Companies who have had the tools in place for three to five years are really gaining from the benefits of competitive edge and the flexibility and ease of low cost maintenance of systems built with these tools. In summary then, properly implemented, case tools offer companies at all stages of maturity in the use of IT substantial benefits. Both the IT staff and the management gain and we have uh, satisfied users and very successful businesses. Alan, many thanks. A summary of Alan's main points again then. The main beneficiaries of CASE, those planning the future development of their computer systems for the first time. Those well down the track of building new systems and find they have new ones to add. Those who need to extract more out of the technology they already have. Those who are re-engineering existing applications into new languages or more flexible environments. Richard, if I can just start with you really. One would expect CASE to be really used by people who are very mature users of of IT development, well, who are developing IT applications rather than those developing new applications. What's your experience been in terms of users? Well, in general terms, I guess a lot of case has been brought forward by the IT directors um, and by the techn technologists within their organisation. Um, but interesting, the, the highest benefits I've ever seen uh, have come where the end users have been sold on the concepts, maybe at, at board level, and have then tried it. Um, to go back to the, the idea of using Crosby and quality and so on, quality really and the productivity and all the rest of it can only really be measured by the profitability of the company or the increased service if it's in a, a different uh, type of organisation. And some of the situations that we've seen are when the modelling techniques that are used at the forefront of the, uh, of the uh, life cycle, the strategy area for example, uh, have enabled IT and uh, the directors of a company to see new ways of doing things. Uh, there's some lovely examples where companies in the first two or three months of some implementation done by case have, have maybe paid for the whole cost of the implementation or one company I remember got a 15% measurable improvement in profitability right on the bottom line. <clears throat> now that's where the real benefit comes but unfortunately this only happens in a, a handful of cases because I, I guess we as an industry haven't really yet learned to get into the into the boardroom well enough and and enable people to visualise their company from this data and processing viewpoint. Alan, what is the main fear of using case? As, as, as John Parkinson said in, his, in that film, short film clip there, two ways, a sort of toy for the DP department and, and high costs, uh, something that perhaps put people off. Is that what you found at all? I think that was certainly true uh, maybe two or three years back. I think it's becoming less true now as we're getting uh, much cheaper tools and we're able to put them onto portable workstations and literally to take them into the boardroom, I think it is breaking the barriers down quite well. And uh, we are seeing, uh, as Richard said, some, some very important gains there. I think especially when people don't know what they don't know about the old techniques, they are very much freer in their way that they think. And uh, we've seen some very important gains by using case tools in the boardroom. Um, and people are becoming used to them as part of their normal life lifestyle now. That's very heartening to yes. hear. Um, David, Obviously, there's still a gulf between uh, general management and, and the ID department. Could, is, is this a sort of bridge that can really bring the two halves together then, Case? I think it's absolutely vital that it does because the, and the Case technology is no more than a technology and it's an enabling tool. What is fascinating about the opportunity this presents at the board level is that here is a chance to present something which we, 
we foresaw in the 70s and couldn't deliver, and that is the bird's eye view of an organization, the map around which you can navigate and find your way, which is telling you in an up-to-date way what is the reality of the structure of that organization. Now, it's our experience that most of the companies with whom we deal have the problem of handling their information as a major constraint on the evolution of their strategies. When they want to change, when they want to regroup, there is one very classic case of a very major and well-known group that quite simply could not carry through the restructuring critical to its future success because its IT systems were in disarray. Now, it's when boards understand that and understand how important it is to them to have that comprehensive view that they will appreciate that the levels of investment that are concerned here are absolutely trifling compared with the benefits that they will deliver. We have to do two things. We've really got to pull that together so that they understand that issue. And secondly, we've got to give the assurance that this is not hype, that it does it, that it achieves it and achieves it reliably. I think over the last two years, it really is as recent as that, we've now got that evidence. And I think people really ought to listen. You've presumably, in terms of evidence, got to provide tangible benefits and, and people have to see it actually working. It, it is, however, playing with fire somewhat to actually get users to, to actually tweak some of the applications early on, is it not? It's a delicate political balance, presumably, to actually manage that situation. Um, <clears throat> I think there's two ways of tweaking, right? One is to tweak through an expert and one is to tweak hands-on. Now, obviously, right. tweaking hands-on is a little bit more dangerous. Uh, but I, I, I had a lovely experience the other day where one managing director was saying to another, he said, do you realise, he said, y you can read this diagram, and he says, and this tells you that we've got it wrong, and he read it out to the other guy, and it was <laughs> tremendous, you know. And then they corrected the diagram, and then that got represented in the case tool, and then went down and affected the database design and the, and the, and the code. But the, the tweaking came from the businessman, and, and one of the important things to go with all the aspects you were talking about earlier is to make sure that the language which is used is the end user language. It has to be done that way. We've, we've been learning recently to de-jargonise case and I think that's very important. Um, Alan, obviously your customers are, you, you, all the areas we've explored today, your customers are heavily involved. Case staff are at a premium. I mean, how, how do you, part of your process presumably goes into developing and, and, and recruiting the right sort of staff to run very the application? Very much so, yes. yes. How do you go about that? Areas you must look for? I think we're certainly looking for people who, ha who have been used to working with structured methodologies in the past. Um, sometimes, of course, they're not the right methodologies and you have to then change, of course, the, the way of working. But certainly, people who have worked within a disciplined regime certainly are, are much better and adapt to case tools very much more quickly uh, than, than people coming into it new from the first time. One of the problems we're finding, incidentally, is that, 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 of course, as you said earlier on, case means uh, enhanced uh, salaries as well as everything else. Uh, but we are finding that if properly used teaching and training can mean that you can give people exposure to case over a gradual process. And because there's always something more for them to get to gain at the end of the day, there's actually something to, for as a career path enhancement as well. It's actually very good. Gentlemen, that's all we've got time for today. Thank you all very much for delving into a quite complicated subject in the space of an hour. We've done very well, actually. Well, again, sadly, that's all we have time for today. I'd like to thank my guests, Richard Barker, David Fairbairn, Alan Topless, and, of course, you for watching. Next week's dossier programme is on mobile communications, a look at cellular telephony and the telepoint and PCN systems. My guests, then, will be Gary Garrard from the PA Consulting Group, Keith Strudders watson editor of Mobile Telecommunications News, and David Savage, managing director of the Aztec Group. In fact, dossier can be seen next Tuesday morning at 9.30, when, in fact, I won't be here, Ken Young will be in the chair. If you haven't subscribed yet, then please call Nick Bancroft on 71 730 I'll be back on Thursday morning at 9.30 with analysis. I hope you'll join me. Until then, it's goodbye from the Computer Channel. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>